Welcome to our show, Code of Arms, which is a look at um, different historical positions on computer art and uh, AI and other realms of digital uh, art. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel. I'm not going to take up any time. I'm going to hand you straight over to Christian Paul, who is um, going to be moderating the talk. Uh, so Christian is the uh, professor of media studies at the New School and also the um, curator of digital art at the Whitney Museum. We're very, very honored and privileged to have her uh, part of this along with all the other guests. Um, so I won't take up too much time, but thanks very much indeed for coming and um, Christiane, I'll leave it with you. Thanks so much for the generous introduction. Thanks for attending and uh, to the panelists for being part of this. I'm very honored to be able to moderate this panel. So in terms of the structure of all of this, I will start by introducing the panelists in the order of their presentations, then give a brief introduction to the panel itself, and then hand it over to the panelists for short presentations, which will be followed by a conversation and Q&A. So um, first presenter will be Lynn hirschman Leeson, who is widely recognized for her innovative work investigating issues that are now recognized as key to the workings of society from the relationship between humans and technology, identity, surveillance, and the use of media as a tool for empowerment against censorship and political repression uh, to many other aspects. Her work uses film, photography, and interactive media, and retrospectives and surveys of her work have been shown at ZKM in Karlsruhe, Germany in 2014, and most recently at the New Museum in New York in 2021. Her work also is in the collection of MoMA, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Tate, and many others, and she's an emeritus professor at the University of California, Davis. After that, we'll hear from Paul Kuhn, a professor of computer science at the University of Pittsburgh. He was the founding dean of the School of Computing and Information at Pitt and has served in other roles, including program manager at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and he is a trustee of the Harold Cohn Trust. As a grad student in the early 80s, Paul helped to edit the Handbook of Artificial Intelligence, and he has worked in AI ever since. Jake Elvis is a media artist living and working in London. They studied at the Slate School of Fine Art and recent works explore their research into machine learning and artificial intelligence. Their practice looks for poetry and narrative in the success and failures of these systems, while also investigating and questioning the code and ethics behind them. Jake's work has been widely exhibited in museums and galleries internationally, among them, the ZKM Karlsruhe, Germany, the Edinburgh Futures Institute, the Zabludovich Collection in London, the Frankfurter Kunstverein in Germany, the VNA in London, Laboral Art Center, and many others. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from all of them. And I will start off by sharing my screen and giving a very brief introduction to what we're going to talk about right now. So our um, society by now has been really infiltrated by AI from surveillance to uh, the AI used in self-driving cars and many other applications. And it is not surprising that we have also seen an explosion of art in this area, investigating the pressing issues. That being said, AI has a long history of being the next big thing, you know, being born in the 1950s and 60s. And since then, we have already seen two so-called AI winters in the 70s. Um, we had AI winter number one in the 90s, AI winter number two. And then once again, AI took off with the blue beating Gary Kasparov 
and we have seen a uh, continuous evolution since then. I also want to point out very briefly in terms of these winters that this follows the overall curve of excitement and inflated expectations, disillusionment, and then enlightenment and plateauing of technological um, evolution in general. So there's uh, nothing remarkable here in the end. And a brief footnote to this, I always found it very interesting that the AI winters seem to coincide with uh, HCI, human computer interface summers. So in terms of technological evolution, we have seen an up and down here. I do not want to get deeply into this very involved diagram. And I know Paul will talk about this a little bit um, more in the following, but what we're calling AI now is also very different from uh, the start of AI, we started with the more uh, symbolic expert systems and heuristics and rules. And we're now really in a phase that is more statistical and focused on machine learning. Um, although there is also this sub-symbolic sector of effective computing. And I'm mentioning this because artists have been working in all of these areas. What we have seen in AI development is a continuous automating of perception in the areas of vision, of speech, of language and knowledge. And artists have been engaging with all of these areas and critically investigated them from the impact of face recognition and identification to uh, text sentiment analysis and how we're constructing knowledge today. So one of the groundbreaking works and really first artist AI was Harold Cohen's Aaron and Paul Cohen will talk a little bit more about this, you know, officially launching in the 70s, but Harold worked on it since the late 60s. We're very happy to have Lynn Hirschman here because she has been involved in various stages from her early chatbot agent Ruby to uh, the more recent shadow stalker with uh, engages with predictive policing and uh, Jake Alves, who has done amazing work in querying the data set and engaging with different kinds of biases in deep fakes. So what we can do as part of this panel is only give um, a slice of what has been going on in the field. And I just want to mention without getting into it, some of the uh, other outstanding works that have been created in this area to give people a bit more of context uh, for this. Among them would be works such as Stephanie Dinkins, not the only one, a bot that is based only on the data set of three different generations of one African-American family or Dinkins' conversations with Bina, her continued dialogues with a social robot questioning, once again, machine learning and its processes as they uh, intersect with race. We have seen works by Zach Blast and Jemima Wyman, such as I'm Here to Learn So, engaging with Microsoft's um, bot Thai, as you may know, this was the kind of teenage uh, figure and bot that was taken off after one weekend after being heavily trolled and turning into a misogynist Nazi. And more recently, since it will come up in conversation, uh, we have seen an enormous amount of work created in the area of GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. While those have a history going back to the 40s, Ian Goodfellow's code has uh, made a huge impact here. And what a GAN essentially is, is um, a software package where you train an AI on a specific image that said you tag it with the creation of something, a generator produces images and a discriminator basically judges whether they're good enough to pass. And this gained more attention through the sale of the portrait of Edmond Bellamy, 
uh, created by a um, group of computer scientists, artists, obvious from France, which sold for more than 400,000 at Christie's. And as you can see, this GAN is geared towards creating more traditional painting. But then we have also seen work such as Mary Flanagan's Grace AI, where she tasked again with the creation of a portrait of Frankenstein pointing to the origin story of AI in Mary Shelley's work. So so this just as um, a brief context for different engagements with AI and I'll stop sharing here and let Lynn take over. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, and uh, I guess I'll start with, with uh, in, in uh, the mid 1990s, they made a film called Technolust and it was about a self replicating automaton. And, and she had a Lonely Hearts um, site on the internet where she talked to people. Um, and so I thought, wouldn't it be great if we actually did that? Uh, so maybe we could show that the first Agent Ruby. So we created Agent Ruby websites portal. And the idea was to try to get her to um, get people who were watching the film while they were watching it, have this download onto their Palm Pilots, which people used in that, in, in that time. Of course, nobody, there, it wasn't called AI at the time. It wasn't called the chatbot at the time. Nobody really knew what it was, but eventually I, I put a call out on the internet, and got it, uh, close to 18 programmers from around the world to see if we could solve this, um, which took, uh, about three, three and a half years. And by the time we finished it, of course, Richard Wallace had already finished uh, his Alice spot and he lived just a few blocks away from me. Um, uh, so, uh, but the way this works is that you type to, you type to um, Agent Ruby, agentruby.net and she had various uh, expressions and mood swings that she would go into uh, as you type to her and she would come up with with uh, very wild responses um, to what you were questioning her. Um, let's see the next one now. Yeah. So um, she still exists, um, and she's in the uh, collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, AgentRuby.net. You can talk to her any any time. And in 2013, they decided to show her and they found when they looked through her and something I hadn't realized that is that that they never sleep these pieces and that they had collected 80 tons of responses globally um, from uh, people interacting with her, which really became a portrait of what the, the world was thinking about during uh, that phase of her life. She was about um, 10 years old then, and they made that into a series of books uh, about uh, uh, the various themes that, that were going through people's minds from 9-11 to the economy to the elections, and so forth. So she became kind of a, a reverse uh, global portrait um, unexpectedly. This was about 12 years before Siri or Alexa. and the one one of the um kind of I, I look at it as amusing now but nobody knew what it was and nobody knew how to interact with it and so it basically went on unnoticed for a really long time because it didn't fit into the imagination of the future and it didn't fit into a historical context of being able to place it as even an artwork so that kind of is the legacy of of pieces that that kind of create are created out of intuition and instinct that really have no no uh, historical grounding. So I wanted to do something beyond just the typing to this character. Um, and we could look briefly at, at Dina. So Dina is the daughter of Ruby and she's much smarter. And um, uh, Dina works by just talking to her and she's actually a, a search engine. And when you talk to her, you could see on a little screen uh, what she's thinking and how she makes her how how she makes her choices and what she, what she chooses to say as an answer to whatever questions being um, asked. So that brings us to the present to, to the quasi present, and this is a piece called Shadow Stalker that I did in um, 1998, which is really about. Um, 
the about predictive policing and the algorithm, uh, the aggressive algorithms that um, that really affect people's lives in an invisible way. I think. Let's see. Are there a few more installation shots? Yeah. Yeah. So this is really about how how the predictive nature of logic can affect people without them knowing about it. And the way the installation works is you go into a room and uh, you can uh, just, all you, all you do is you put your email in it and all this information about you and about even your family come up in this form of a shadow of you walking through it as you listen to a, a 10 minute video that uh, is narrated by Tessa Thompson about what predictive policing actually is and how it started. I think we've got a little Instagram um, th three minute uh, clip that we could show that goes into the details of how it was made with the collaborators. So uh, do you wanna show that if you can? When I was in high school, I put a drawing in a Xerox machine and it got stuck in the machine. When I pulled it out, it was much better than my own drawing because the technology had crumpled it and put ink in it in a way I never would have done. I think that that was my first experience with the symbiotic relationship with technology and uh, individual expression. Living in the Bay Area, you breathe technology. That allowed me to be more attuned to the uh, technological landscape and also find a group of people I've uh, closely collaborated with. Shadow Stalker is an installation about secret surveillance. And one of the newest elements of surveillance is uh, called predictive policing. And predictive policing puts demarcations in an area that AI and other elements predict will have crimes. Often using racial profiling in demographics in low-income districts. Lynn has a sketch and a concept. You interpret it, come up with some ideas, and then we talk about it, keep sort of iterating from there. This 3D spatial scanning camera scans the environment and makes a shadow of you. Entering the installation, you're prompted to enter your email address. Uh, that email address is sent to a backend service that I've written um, that interfaces with third-party service to give me back a bunch of information about you. Names that you've gone by, your age, your date of birth, addresses, people that you may know. That data shows up as sort of this particle cloud of text, and that shows up in the background in your shadow. Your shadow that trails you is digital information often that you didn't know was out there. It kind of allows you to see all that you're being tracked by. This is an image that's in the film. It's the, a picture of the spirit of the dark web uh, talking about the culture of fear that we were in. Invisible algorithms are extremely lethal in the control of a paranoid society. It's really about beginning to understand how much of our information is available free and how much we're giving away. I think that we're headed in a, a period of hopeful introspection and understanding of uh, what we have allowed to happen, both to the planet, to our future generations, and to ourselves, and become conscious in a new kind of reparation that we're able to make in the time that we have left. Thanks so much, Lynn. <laughs>
So next we have Paul Cohen. Thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, I'd like to share my screen. Um, can you see uh, a picture or can you see something else? You can see a picture. Good, thank you. Um, and now I need to go back to where I was. All right, well, let's get started. Um, I'm not Harold Cohen. I'm Harold's son, Paul. I'm the trustee of the Harold Cohen estate. Um, and I will talk a little bit about Harold during these few minutes. And then during the question answer session, we will probably talk more about issues in AI more generally. So Harold is known as an artist and as the author of Aaron, which is probably the longest lived and most creative AI program in daily use. Uh, his death uh, in 2016 was the end of a very lengthy relationship between artists and AI. Um, and it was a varying relationship. At times, Aaron handled all the aspects of the art making. And at other times, Aaron served Harold by making drawings that Harold would then develop in paintings. He had a really long career. He was a very successful painting in the 1960s, painter in the 1960s, but then he left the London scene to join the visual arts department at the University of California in San Diego. And that's where he learned to program a computer. Here you see a very early image, 1969. Like many other people, he started using available plotter hardware, but he really wanted to control how images were made. And so for the bulk of his career, he built the machines that made the images. He was highly, highly technical, which I think is an aspect of his persona that um, is often overlooked. He was a skilled machinist, um, really good mechanical engineer, a uh, good electrical engineer. So programming a computer was pretty easy for Harold and even rebuilding one when shippers damaged it were, was well within his capabilities. I say, I say I really want people to know this about Harold because Harold really wanted to understand what the, he, he always said, you know, you can't make art if you can't master your tools. He, he could grind paint, he could uh, do stone masonry, um, and eventually he could build computing uh, devices. So he really wanted to be in complete control of what was going on in of those schools. Uh, growing up with Harold's paintings, um, I was always struck as a kid by what I thought was a very weird mix of biological and mechanical motifs. This is a painting from 1963. And then on the right, you see another uh, painting uh, from, um, uh, I think, uh, the 1990s, uh, late 1990s. I want to congratulate Miller for showing Harold's pre-computing work as well as more recent algorithmic art, because I've always thought of them as contiguous. And I've thought of these sort of queer mechanical, biological motifs as coming out of Harold's technically scientifically curious and extremely well-informed mind. Um, he, he's all, he had always been interested in, in, in the mechanical and the biological. Anyway, from about 71 on, uh, virtually all of Harold's work was in one way or another algorithmic. And it was all concerned with one question, uh, which is what makes an image evocative? He wanted to know whether algorithms could produce evocative images, not only, um, you know, occasionally or accidentally, but consistently. And so from the 70s on, uh, Harold explored which aspects of marks, open and closed shapes, implied figure and ground, lines that look they, like they were drawn by hand rather than bezier curves, which of these things gave the impression of intentionality. And images from this period look a lot like, um, oh, you're looking down at a pond, at an amoeba, or maybe you're looking at um, Native American petroglyphs, or maybe it's children's drawings. Um, these were all early influences on the development of Aaron. The images were black and white. Uh, you can see here a robot drawing um, 
uh, image on the ground. Uh, then Harold would color them in by hand. Harold was really concerned uh, with color throughout his career. He was a colorist as a painter. Um, and color was a big deal in the development of Aaron for a long time. As, as um, Christian mentioned early in his work, uh, Aaron was very much of the sort of time of AI. It was essentially an expert system. He was good friend with Ed Feigenbaum, uh, who was sort of the father of expert systems, also my advisor in grad school. Um, and Aaron encoded in a fairly direct way what Harold knew about color and composition and other aspects of images. And that went on for about 10 years and Harold kept struggling with color uh, until he finally realized that he got better results from some really simple algorithms that had no correspondence at all to his own knowledge. And once he made that switch, he said that Aaron was a distinctly different kind of intelligence from his own. And I think he spent a lot of time puzzling over why it was so successful. Um, over the years, um, the, the line drawings that he colored by hand became more and more representational, um, culminating um, in um, the uh, late 80s, early 90s with figurative drawing. Um, and then by 1995, um, Aaron sort of hit the apex of its autonomy. I don't actually think that's the right word. I think we should speak more precisely. Aaron, by the 90s, mid 90s, controlled all aspects of the making of the image. It would compose um, images of people in rooms, and then it would instruct this sort of marvelous robot uh, to draw the images, mix its own dyes, color the drawings, there was an exhibition at the Boston Computer Museum that ran for weeks and it really enthralled audiences, you know, audiences of all ages. Um, the images were representational. They were pretty accessible. The machine was very colorful. The machine was incredibly cool. Harold really liked talking to gallery audiences. He spent hours and hours there, but he came to worry that the spectacle of the machine uh, painted, uh, detracted from the paintings themselves. And eventually he, he sort of abandoned representational stuff altogether and returned to abstraction and simplicity. The, the path though was certainly not direct. Um, for about a decade, um, you saw this sort of climbing down from representational through things that were sort of highly evocative and representational to more and more abstract. Um, and um, by really uh, the, you know, the year of his death, um, Harold had demoted Aaron to the, the sort of poser of problems, poser of difficult painting problems for him. Uh, Aaron then became sort of not an artist in its own right, but, but a poser of problems. Harold liked to joke that he was would be the first artist in history to have a posthumous exhibition of new work. Uh, everyone thought that was very funny. As trustee of his estate, I can tell you it's not funny at all. Um, but the quip hinges on the word new. And each of Harold's images is indeed, each of Aaron's images is indeed unique, instantly recognizable, um, but uh, instantly recognizable as belonging to a particular version of the code. The images aren't really new in any sense, other than being unique. Um, Harold did toy with the idea of making Aaron modify itself. And in fact, we spent some time talking together about machine learning. Um, but instead, he reduced Aaron's autonomy over time from, from you know, the mid 90s to, to his death. And you have to ask, why is this? Why did he reduce Aaron's autonomy? First of all, he had very little faith in machine learning. Again, I think it had to do with relinquishing control. He believed that only an artist could make Aaron, and he believed that he was the only artist who could make Aaron. Um, he wanted to retain control of Aaron's development, but here's the important thing. I think Harold always viewed Aaron as how he, Harold, made art. So there's sort of, you know, there was no, no way to convince Ar Harold to release Aaron, to let other people work on Aaron, to make Aaron something um, in the public domain. 
because really Aaron was his alter ego in a sense, and he just wasn't going to let other people fool around with that. So in conclusion, you know, I think you'll see that Harold tackled a lot of the thorniest issues in algorithmic art. He tackled the nature of evocation, the working relationship between artist and machine. He tackled learning and self-modification, whether machine intelligence needs to correspond to human intelligence, how algorithmic art should be shown in public, how it should be priced and sold, a lot of other things. So besides building machines to make amazing art, he was also a pretty deep thinker. And in that sense, I think he's got to be viewed as a pioneer. Uh, for those who want to know more, go to the website. There's a whole lot of art there, but there's also some really fine writing. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. It's really terrific to have your presentation and Lynn's back to back and really broaden the idea of uh, what AI can do. So I'll hand it over to Jake. So I'm Jake. <laughs> it's lovely to be here in person. Um, hey, fantastic. Cool. So yeah, having a look around the show, it's so wonderful to be like surrounded by such historic work from computer art, kind of the birth in a way of starting to use systems with digital processes, with like, early plotters and kind of using these sorts of materiality. And in a way, I'm kind of the next generation of artists sort of working with really high tech algorithms, trying to work out how to use these machine learning algorithms. Um, actually, the last slide, the slide before, was um, kind of going right back in a way, kind of uh, when I was at the Slade, which is actually where Harold Cohen and his brother Bernard Cohen were also very involved. I actually lived, and one of my best friends was Harold Cohen's grandson, um, or great-grand-nephew. I get a little bit confused whether it was him or Bernard. Um, but anyway, yeah, I was kind of there, also doing plotter drawings like they were back in the day. Um, and actually, this is one of my kind of really early pieces where I was getting like old circuit boards from computers that I was using and running them through the printing presses that had been used by the likes of Freud and Paul Arago and kind of really thinking about like the materiality of this thing. Um, but whilst I was at Slade, I was also, yeah, became increasingly engaged with machine learning and the same sorts of questions of algorithmic creativity, of how far can you push agency with the machine, um, but maybe also realizing, moving beyond that, that the questions have changed a bit. And maybe since the 60s, we now have to be thinking a little bit more socially as well about how are these algorithms actually being used. So I'm going to show a few of my pieces from the last few years. And um, you might see that kind of there's a bit of a progression. So they start um, maybe thinking more about those questions around autonomy and then move slightly more into the political. So actually, the first one is a bit political. So we start with the first video. And this is... Um, Basically, the 20 most influential figures in tech, uh, as defined by Forbes, and every time they say a number, they've been extracted and kept in the order they said them. So this is a piece that I did in collaboration with a machine learning algorithm to extract numbers. So we can play a minute of this, maybe. It's quite fun. <laughs> Five, six, five, 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 four, five, four, one, six, six, seven, 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 eight, eight, nine, nine, five thousand. One billion, one thirty million, one hundred million, two billion, one, two hundred. Two hundred fifty, seventy, one, ten thousand, one hundred fifty, ten thousand, eighteen thousand, ten, sixteen, sixteen, two, three hundred fifty, twenty hundred, two, 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 twenty three hundred fifty, fifty, ten hundred fifty, one, nine thousand, nine thousand, one thousand, one six billion, hundred million, hundred million, one hundred million, six hundred, one hundred million, one, one, ten billion, five, thirty million, one, three, two, twenty. 27 million to 100. One. One. Five, 30,000. Zero. One. Ten. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Three. Three. Three or four hundred billion. One trillion. Three hundred eighty-two. Three hundred fifty thousand. Three hundred fifty. Five. Four. Four. Twenty. Ten. Or one. Three trillion. Seventeen. Four hundred trillions. And five. Millions. One. Tens. Thousands. Millions. And five hundred billion. Fifteen. Four. Six trillion. Two million. Five thousand. Fifty billion. Sixty. Sixty. Four. Fifty. Five. Four, 50, five. One, billion. one billion. Forty. Ten. Zero. Three. Four hundred million. Four billion. American in the list um, and I think we've got Zuckerberg next but let's move on um, so next up yeah so I guess that in a way it's thinking about the metrics who's actually in charge so really for me kind of as an artist working with machine intelligence using machine learning um, deep learning processes I'm kind of thinking much more in a way now about 
who these systems are being built by and who they're being built for. Um, and that's kind of what the biggest question now that I'm considering and considering through, you know, injection of queer data sets of how can we kind of subvert these things, play with them, point out the failures and poetry and the mistakes and things they weren't meant to do. Um, so I guess this whole thing of, yeah, thinking through the failures and I guess Lynn was also saying this, kind of finding that failure in the system. That's often, for me, where the real character comes from and the real artistry and kind of almost sets up this more symbiotic collaborative relationship with the algorithm. So this was the first piece that I created using a machine learning algorithm. And it was a reference to this wonderful piece of art, Namjoon Pike's TV Buddha. It's a seminal piece of video art of the Buddha looking at the CCTV feed of the Buddha. Um, and my idea was working with a collaborator, um, Roland Arnold, could we get an early algorithm? So this was basically one of the first of predecessors to a deep fake algorithm, where we would train it on thousands and thousands of images of the Buddha and say, OK, let's have a Buddha looking at an AI try and recreate the essence of an image of the Buddha. And what happened was it completely failed, right? So these are the sorts of images it came up with. I think, are they moving? Yeah, you can see sort of these quite abstracted, they kind of like flicker a bit and do these quite strange things. And to me, they're kind of almost like abstract expressionist paintings. And it's actually showing the guts of an AI in its infancy failing to create the essence of the Buddha. Because we didn't have the training data. It's like the limitations of this system, only how well you can train it as the artist and give it the data that needs to be given. So it was a failure, but it, there was a real poetry in that. And I love that. It's kind of finding the poetry in the failures of these systems. So yeah, I think the next picture shows the Buddha looking at the AI failed to create the image of the Buddha. Um, back in 2016, which was, I think, only about a year after Ian Goodfellow, a couple of years after Ian Goodfellow came up with this idea that you can create these fake images from vast data sets of images. Um, so that was kind of, yeah, our first experiment. So moving on from there, I guess as an artist, one of the ideas that got me most excited about this area of AI was this idea of a latent space. So this is basically this idea that you can think of AI in a really spatial way, right? So let's say we're training a facial recognition algorithm to learn images of people, of humans. We give it millions or hundreds of thousands of different faces, photographs of faces. And then the machine learning comes in, right? So it starts to kind of trace across these images, kind of search across these images for what they all have in common. And it basically abstracts that into lower and lower level features, um, starting with kind of just lines and shapes and textures, and then starts to see eyes and noses, and then it starts to see whole faces. Um, and basically, what will start to happen is the algorithm will plot these faces in this latent space. It doesn't have to be faces, whatever your data set is. So let's say kind of all of the images of white faces exist over here, and all the images of black faces, or male faces, or female faces, or all of these different sorts of things. And as it's learning from these faces, it plots them in dimensions. And then you can use it to say, you know, OK, there's a new image. What does that correspond to? It corresponds to a white male person in their 30s. Um, this could also be images of, I don't know, birds and dogs and cats, or it could be the human language. <laughs> so you can kind of think of this thing as a spatial, and then you can start to make sense of the data. Um, so an early piece that I created, so yeah, next slide, is actually a piece called Latent Space. And again, it's one of the earliest algorithms um, going on a journey through this space, right? So once you have this space, you can then say, create me an image of what might exist here. Not an image in the original data set, but an image that could exist at that point in space. For this algorithm, I actually said, rather than creating me like a realistic image of any point, which we might have seen, and I'll show you a couple of examples later, I wanted it just to skirt through and move through this space. And for me, that is kind of you know, trying to push towards giving the computer agency. But at the same time, what it creates is I don't know, quite banal. You'll see in the next piece as well that they're also incredibly limited. But for me, there's a real beauty in what it was able to do. So this is, yeah, moving through this latent space. And it might right now be kind of at a point that corresponds with, I don't know, trees or birds or skies, or maybe that's a, I don't know, volcano or a toilet seat. <laughs> like, there's all sorts of things in this data set. It's 14 million images that it's learned from. It's a standard open source data set. And this is just kind of going on a journey through this space, navigating through it. Um, so yeah, the next image is actually, you can see it um, this month. 
I think it's on for another couple of months, um, and it's showing under, I think it's the largest ceiling mounted LED in Europe, and it's, it's under um, the Gherkin at Fenchurch Street. There we go. So yeah, it's kind of on this, on this colossal LED, and you can kind of see the whole space light up, which is quite fun. It's also got a soundscape composed by an amazing um, musician, the Analog Girl. So yeah, maybe if we move on. Are the, is the arrows not really working? Maybe if you just use the arrows on the keyboard, it might work a bit better. Yeah, there we go. So OK, so this piece, moving on from that, I became really interested in how can I set up this kind of dialogue um, between the algorithm that you just saw and pair it with another algorithm, which is for labeling images, right? So this is a piece called Closed Loop, and it's effectively showing, if we go to the next slide, actually, I think we can see a little demo of it. Um, OK, yeah, so we can see here, right now, it's seeing an image of a bird with a red beak. OK, so sorry, it's seeing an image of a large piece of paper, right? And now it's trying to generate a new image of a large piece of paper. So that's like this point in latent space. You can basically input a sentence into that. <laughs> um, and actually, these algorithms have got so good now that if I did this again today, this would be a really realistic image of a large piece of paper. But actually, I like the fact that it's kind of failing and sort of jotting off and sort of you know, misinterpreting itself. So now it's trying to create a new image of a bird flying in the air, which is what it saw in the last image. And it kind of goes round and round in this feedback loop where I never quite know, as the artist, where it's going to go to. And I never really guided it either. So now it's seeing a sky is blue and clear. And then it's going to try and create a new image of a blue and clear sky. Um, so if we go on to the next one, maybe. Um, so yeah, sorry, going on a very quick journey <laughs> for a bunch of pieces. This, this next piece, though, OK, so moving on from thinking about kind of the limitations and failures, and I think that last piece does kind of show the limitations of what this AI has learned, because it got stuck in things like cat loops, which I thought was hilarious. There's so many cats in the data set, and it, you know, it, it shows how banal it can be. It just sort of constantly sees skies and bits of paper. And you know, I remember feeding in um, the Pope, and I think it just sort of said, uh, what did it tell me? It just said man wearing glasses. I just thought that's great. It's sort of this way of like decontextualizing everything that it sees in the most banal way, depending on the data that we have given it. Um, so this piece, I was, guess I was thinking more about how can we kind of recontextualize or reframe an artificial intelligence, kind of the most cutting edge technology that we had at the time um, in nature, and basically take it into this primal landscape, the Essex marshes, somewhere I've been going since I was a little kid. Um, and yeah, if we go to the next slide, so basically I trained um, a machine learning algorithm on wading birds from the Essex marshes, and then, and then with the next slide, took it out into the marshes, planted it in the mud on a screen, and again, it's like this sort of ancient landscape, there's something so primal about it, and so sort of rich with life and bird life, and you know, it's a bird sanctuary, which is why I wanted to do it there. And then I created a video projecting the artificially generated birds across the marsh in dialogue with the real birds. So we can see a second of this video. Um, also, I'd say that the sounds, if we can hear any sounds, are all created as well by being an AI being on um, 10 hours of field recordings. Skip forwards again. Um, so, moving on from that piece, um, I guess the last three years of my research have been to do with, I guess, thinking about representation in AI systems and in data sets. And in a way, how can we work with these systems to show alternate identities and bodies which aren't normally represented and shown by these data sets. So all of these faces that you're seeing here are generated faces. Um, they're deep fakes. I say deep fakes in inverted commas. Technically, a deep fake is actually something you can also control. This is kind of what happens before a deep fake when you're just generating these kind of unsupervised images. Um, so these, again, are all faces which are points in this space. And generally, 
it has a real bias because it's, the data is gathered by white American engineers um, towards a certain kind of identity and not very good at representing otherness or queerness or you know, often failing on women of color or trans people. So my idea was to take this model and queer it, right? by feeding it with a thousand images of drag things, drag queens, drag things. <laughs> and this is what happens. So maybe actually if we go back and forth again, so if we go back to the last one and then forward to this one again, you'll see. So all of these images then turn into these images with the addition of a thousand drag performers. And using drag, because drag is a way of challenging society's norms around gender, right? And you know, trying to make sure that I also had drag kings and you know, cis women doing drag queen or drag monster or drag things. Um, so yeah, in the next in the next slide, you can see a little bit of a move through <coughs> again this kind of latent space of what every you know what this neural network has learnt after it's been queered. So all the weights in this neural network have literally been kind of shifted into this space of otherness and queerness. Um, and in a way, the system's kind of been broken. So this kind of raises questions of. Do we want to be represented in these systems in the first place? Or do we want to just kind of mess with them, like dirty them or queer them or like break them for whoever might own the data originally? So I think there's a real interesting question there, also like of obfuscation. So a lot of people put makeup, like dazzle makeup on their faces so they're no longer re recognized by AI systems. Um, so the last video that I might show you a second of, if we have time, we could just show a minute of it. You think we still have a bit of time? <laughs> we show a second just of it. So this yeah. video here is um, basically a duet between my collaborator on this project. She's called Me the Drag Queen, very confusing name, um, and her deep fake doppelganger, right? So here, in a way, it's kind of maybe trying to be a bit of a, like a satire on our idea of society's relationship with AI. Um, so we can just watch maybe the beginning minute of this and then how we do it. I think when I transferred this file, it might have, um, it was meant to start halfway through. So I don't know if you want to maybe just go sort of halfway through it and then you can actually see them next to each other, um, if that's easy. If it's not, then you can also just watch it on my website. <laughs> Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Anything you can be, I can be greater. Sooner or later, I'm greater than you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I can shoot a partridge with a single cartridge. I can get a sparrow with a bow and arrow. I can live on bread and cheese. I know me on. Yep. So can a rat. Any note you can sing, I can sing higher. I can sing any note higher than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. 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 How do you right, sing that I'm high? That. I'm a girl. <laughs> um, but you can watch this online on my website, jkelwitz.com. I've also created a whole web app where you can actually interact with all of my deep fake drag kind of creatures and swap out bodies and kind of thinking about the ethics and politics of who gets to control whose bodies. Um, and that's on zz.ai, so zizi.ai. Um, there you go. Okay, thanks so much, Jake. And um, another shout out to Jake because uh, they were able to join us really last minute. Are uh, you? <laughs> You have seen the announcements, you know, listing Nick Lambert. Unfortunately, Nick got really sick this morning and uh, couldn't make it. So Jake graciously jumped in. So thanks again for all of your presentations. I think we got a really good slice of approaches to AI in art. I want to start off with a question that is kind of obvious, yet one that we're always being asked. You know? So in the past three to five years, we have really seen an explosion of AI-focused art exhibitions responding to the increasing role of AI in art practice, which is based on the machine learning and data processing and decision making for the purposes of anything ranging from commerce to entertainment. And um, my question here is, what 
role does and can art play in reflecting on these technological developments and um, futures. And maybe we start with Paul, since you're the non-artist on the panel, to come to it from a CS perspective, and then Lynn and Jake from the artistic one. Paul, you're muted still, yeah. <laughs> So the question is, what role can uh, artists play on, in reflecting on AI? Um, and you know, I think Jake's Jake's sort of rapid tour through his work is a great example of what artists can um, do to reflect on AI. And quite frankly, I was pretty skeptical about it. We can talk later about GANs and so on and so forth, but um, but. That's a failure of my imagination. Um, and I think Jake is a really good example of a, an active imagination thinking hard about what art can say about AI. So um, the answer I thought about last night is really quite mundane compared with what Jake has been showing us. But I do wanna, I do wanna point out two things um, about AI researchers uh, and perhaps about science and technology in general, which I think are that could well be addressed by, by artists. The first is that essentially all AI is task oriented and it is subservient to humans. Virtually everything is being built um, for one kind or another, one kind of commerce or another. Um, and when I was working um, in government a few years back, I actually ran a program on humans communicating with computers where I experienced firsthand how much trouble scientists and technologists have thinking about the machine as doing, being anything other than sort of a power tool. Right? I mean, that's what scientists and technologists think about AI. They think it's a tool for getting stuff done. Um, I think maybe artists can help us change our view of AI from being this kind of transactional, task-oriented uh, tool to something more reflective or creative or collaborative. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen with um, Lynn's comments and also with Jake's, uh, it can also help us understand the role of AI in society. The second thing I think that is a limitation of scientists and engineers is that we tend to be very concerned with the here and now. Uh, certainly philosophers take a much longer view. So one of the reasons people sort of complain about philosophers' crazy thought experiments, you know, the brain and the vat and things like that is that they don't understand that philosophy isn't about the here and now, it's about what's possible. It may be centuries before it happens, but if it can happen, then it's a subject for philosophy. And I wonder if the same isn't true of art. So I'd kind of like to see art take a similarly long-term view. I think a lot of what um, we'll hear about today is art commenting on what's happening right this minute. You know, art commenting on, um, the algorithmic bias, uh, surveillance, things like that. Um, but I think there's also this great opportunity to think very far into the future. Something that scientists and technologists tend not to do, but artists and philosophers probably can. Yeah, th thanks so much, Paul. And I want to pick up a little bit later on the idea of autonomy and um, agency again. And um, yeah, Lynn, handing it over to you. You have been one of the people who have been far ahead in thinking about uh, AI, you know, and as you mentioned in your presentation, people were not quite ready for what they were seeing or supposed to interact with. Yeah, it, it took about 20 years or so till, till um, but but I, I think that, that uh, I wasn't really thinking about doing something with AI, I was just trying to do something that, that dealt with kind of conditions of, of culture. And I think that, that what, um, 
what what one can say is that you could look at the metaphors of things that are being created. I'm not a programmer, and um, I can look at it without understanding why how it's done, but rather think about why it's done. And so when you look at things like uh, people who don't exist, now is is this really something that is reflective of a cultural fear of extinction? Would this have happened in any other time? And um, also about autonomy. I'm not sure that these programs don't have it. I'm not sure that they're that that they're only reading logic, particularly as they're getting more complex and more, um, uh, and, and have a wider reach. And what's the future of, of machine autonomy? And will it get to a point where they they are um, where they can't be controlled? Um, I, I mean, look at Alice and Bob when they were created, for instance, you know, the, the bots that Facebook made that created their own language that were instantly murdered or erased uh, to keep them from, from um, growing bigger or creating more progeny. So I think it just opens up a lot of questions about um, uh, the future and possibilities. And I think artists uh, can play a unique role in uh, raising those questions. Once again, we'll return to the um, creativity and autonomy a little bit later. Jake, your uh, presentation already showed a lot of ways in which art can make a contribution here. But do you want to further comment a little bit? I agree with what the other two said. I think there are some really interesting things to unpick there because I think we also sometimes will have different definitions of what some of these things are that we're talking about. And I think that is one of the things that we can do in art is to try and unpick some of those things and talk about some of these themes. And I think actually it's a fantastic thing because you can really take like a sort of critical step back. You, we don't have the same kind of responsibility or accountability as an engineer has where they've got to create something that actually has a purpose right and that actually functions and I can create something completely purposeless that fails just to kind of show the inner workings of a machine and I'm actually part of a research project at the moment at the Edinburgh Futures Institute looking at how artists can help to demystify the field of artificial intelligence um, kind of by doing that, you know, in a way, the whole AI drag thing is a little bit of a red herring there, because it's like, I am literally constructing like an AI body, which I think is a real mystification. And actually this whole thing we have to want to anthropomorphize AI, which I think is actually a big mistake. But in a way, by doing that, I'm trying to hope to like, also deconstruct that or like unpick it a bit or open up the black box to a new, I don't know, to a much wider audience as well. So I like hope kind of all of my work can engage different people who might not talk about this stuff. And like, you know, with the AI thing, with the drag thing, you can actually see the skeleton that the deep fake is built on and start to see how these processes work. Um, I also think like, yeah, talking about like utopias, I think there's something really interesting in that, that actually as artists, we can also talk about, we don't always have to be dystopic. <laughs> we can also say, what about like alternate utopias, things that no one else has ever thought about? Like, what about, I don't know, obviously all the PR companies are always pushing AI utopias, and then there's a lot of AI theorists that are pushing real dystopias, but I like the idea that we can kind of push alternate, like queer utopias and alternate visions um, for where AI can go, including like a collaboration, including how great is AI when like humans' creativity, such as an artist or a performer, is next to the cold, sterile process of a machine, and how can we bring narrative out of that, and how can we get people to understand what's going on through that, maybe? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, this is a really important topic. Let's uh, dive into that a little bit more. So one of the recurrent themes in AI art has been creativity and the potential of autonomous art making or collaboration between the artist and machine. So um, the presentation on Aaron was a really interesting example on that, the way that um, Harold Cohen confirmed configured thought about those relationships and Lynn just mentioned well you know maybe there is more autonomy than we uh, than we think so um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about what constitutes autonomy and uh, agency obviously you know as Paul pointed out those AI algorithms are originally conceived 
for a specific purpose. And that purpose will always be inscribed into what the creation process is, yet there may be agency in that aspect too. So I'd like to hear your opinions on that. <laughs> uh, sh well, sure. Actually, um, I was just thinking. <laughs> um, so what I thought I was going to say was that, um, well, first of all, let me start this way. Um, these, when somebody writes a program to do something, if the program does it, you can't really say that the program is autonomous of the programmer. I think that would be, that would be absurd. If you write a program to intentionally surprise you, and here I don't want to put words in Jake's mouth, but, but I sort of think that that's what he's doing, um, then you've written a program to intentionally surprise you. And while the surprise um, may be genuine, uh, and it may be exciting, I still don't think it's a mark of autonomy. Um, and if it is, it's very circumscribed autonomy. So, so basically, I don't think programs are autonomous, um, except, with a, except in a very precise sense. Um, I think we have to view autonomy as an asymmetric relationship between two agents. And the relationship goes like this. I grant you autonomy to work in a very precisely circumscribed space, and I accept responsibility for what you do. It's a highly asymmetric relationship. So for example, when I grant autonomy to my daughter to drive a car when she was a teenager, I accepted responsibility for what she would do. And I specified the space in which she was allowed to exercise that autonomy. She can drive a car on surface streets, but not the freeway or whatever it happens to be, right? But autonomy is always a highly asymmetric relationship between the grantor of autonomy and the agent that acts autonomously. But the grantor of the autonomy is always responsible. And that's the nature of the relationship. And I think that that characterizes the relationship between Harold and Aaron. I'm guessing it characterizes the relationship between Jake and um, this sort of marvelous exploration of the latent space of deep fakes. Uh, so, you know, there are rules in autonomy. You, you, there, there is no such thing as saying, oh, you know, you're autonomous. Go do anything you just do. It's a highly, it's a highly structured, highly controlled relationship that's subject to rules. The only other thing I, I want to say that is that um, we shouldn't fake ourselves into the following kind of, um, well, I think it's sort of nonsense. We shouldn't fake ourselves into this kind of nonsense of saying, well, look, because the machine did something inexplicable, it's autonomous and smart. Inexplicability isn't the same as autonomy. If you don't understand why the machine did what it did, that means you don't understand why the machine did what it did. That's it, right? And, but I think people take serendipity and um, a failure to understand what the machine does as some sort of mark of autonomy, and I think that's nonsense. All right. Um, well, I I think, you know, you, the, the whole idea of master-slave control of, of these programs is something that you, you have to look at. I mean, what about mistakes? And what about mistakes we don't expect and that we didn't intend to put in that have a completely different, um, different trajectory? I mean, that may not be autonomous, but it, it's a different way of, of, of reading uh, into something that's, that's unexpected 
and and I think it's really an ex exciting. I think mistakes and failures are really exciting because it it, it shows kind of an in inevitability of um, of a, a broader range of possibilities. I don't think that's. Uh, Thank I don't think that's um, contradictory, actually, because um, what you describe, Lynn, is something that many artists are looking for, and Jake pointed that out uh, too, you know, the failures, the poetic failures and the mistakes, but there's still um, a result of certain kinds of rules, you know, so um, I think, Paul, without putting words into your mouth, would um, be saying ultimately yes, but there is still, even if they are first quote unquote, inexplicable to us, there's still the logical result of something. And I think it's precisely that productive tension that may make things interesting. About. I kind of feel like there's something interesting semantically going on here as well, where we're like, I don't know if I fully agree with the definition here of autonomy. I kind of feel like maybe there is something quite autonomous in many ways going on with a lot of these systems. And I'd say they probably are intelligent as well. They have a certain kind of intelligence. What I would say is that they're not they don't have intentionality, they don't have agency, that they are still obviously systems with rules that we have created. But there is something really interesting that goes on, especially with modern processes, with using deep learning, where some sort of, there's this black box thing, right? <laughs> and this neural network is learning from data and it's coming to conclusions and we can't fully understand how it's coming to the conclusions that it's coming to. And I think that's a really interesting point. And that kind of goes beyond, in a way, like traditional emergence or randomness. That's going into something that starts to make us really question how do our own brains work? And you know, DeepMind is developing these algorithms as neuroscientists to try and understand how the human brain works. They're not trying to create this to make a human brain. I think that's a really important point. They're not trying to create consciousness. I think a lot of people get really distracted and I think that's a red herring. But they are doing it to try and understand processes in our human brain. So I think, you know, there definitely are autonomous I would say things going on, they're sort of certain kinds of intelligence, but it's just so vastly different from any kind of human intelligence. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I think there is something really interesting there. But I also say there's like a massive history of this in systems art and computer art. I mean, like going right back to like Duchamp rolling a dice or cage, it's not that far off that. It's like still a tool and you're kind of creating this sense of emergence and randomness. It's just now the tools are vastly more complex, I'd say. Mm -hmm. But yeah, not conscious. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one I draw the line. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. And I think one of Alan Turing's big achievements also was to very early on make a distinction between human and machine intelligence and pointing out, well, maybe we need to think about intelligence in a different way, you know, um, that gets away from an imitation of human intelligence mm -hmm. per se, even though the Turing test did precisely that or set that um, up. So I want to broaden this out a little bit to what recently has been referred to as the trend of Ghanism, getting a little bit um, deeper in those kinds of um, ideas also of uh, deep learning. And we have seen so much art created in that vein. I'm not the biggest fan, honestly, of um, the type of GANs that are just trying to replicate what humans have already done very well in terms of, oh, here is Renaissance painting, or here is the AI that uh, creates work like Mondrian. I'm always wondering what, what's the point here, you know? Um, but I think, um, Jake, you already pointed to uh, some of the potential here. So I uh, was wondering what your takes in general are on that area of practice, of tasking an AI with something that a discriminator judges ultimately and where the potential for uh, this kind of exploration lies. I'm glad you asked that. Now I can be a bit sassy. Um, I feel like, yes, there are a lot of artists out there, often not coming so much from kind of an art background of like thinking about what they're trying to do in a critical sense or a sort of narrative sense. And often it's actually people coming much more from the engineering side, which I have no problem with at all. And actually some of the most interesting artists working in this field, really pushing things forward, are engineers. Um, but there is a large proliferation, which you might have all seen, of like people kind of doing things like style transfer. It's like, let's take a photo and make it a Van Gogh, or let's kind of generate a Mondrian painting. And I would totally agree with you. I think 
in a way that is just mimicry, really. It's not really doing anything new. And it's interesting to me as well that a lot of early engineers or artists working with these techniques try to validate it by using data sets of paintings. And I think that's exactly as well what photography did, where they were trying to recreate Renaissance paintings to try and prove the validity of this new form and new medium. And it wasn't until artists started to reframe this and think about it and take like, a camera out onto the street and really question the medium and move beyond like how can we recreate a painting, which is the kind of ultimate art form. Um, and you know, I think some of my art has kind of done that a bit, so I'm being a bit hypocritical, but I think I've always tried to do it for some kind of criticality or message or reason why I'm doing that, rather than just creating something and saying, because this looks like a pretty painting, it's a valid or interesting piece of artwork. So, yes. <laughs> Len or Paul, do you have any thing to add? <laughs> Well, I mean, on the rolling the dice thing, um, you, uh, Duchamp or Cade rolled the dice, but, but the dice didn't then roll themselves. And I think that uh, when you create a system that, um, uh, that, 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 that does somewhat what you're asking it to, and then if it can create uh, an aberration of that on its own and continual aberrations, you're going into a completely different uh, uh, randomness of, of understanding. And I, I think the part of it, the problem is that we apply our logic to it and can't see possibly the edges of where a different language is. is yeah, I absolutely agree that uh, aberration in and of itself is a great inspiration for, you know, um, creation and taking off as an artist and exploring art making from a different perspective, maybe. So one of the questions raised by even the title of this panel is also institutions. And I was wondering uh, what you think about strategies that art institutions and the art world can use to introduce AI art to more of a mainstream audience. We already talked about demystification. I think there's an, a very important role for AI art to fulfill. I'm also thinking of Lynn's work here in terms of predictive policing and all of the political aspects that come into it. What would you think are strategies that are needed by art institutions and the art world to bring this discourse more to the forefront? Well, first, I think you have to have more museums showing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's really lacking. There are very few places in the world that have the, um, have the perception and, and visionary idea that you you can have curators of this media and uh, and create the means for it to be shown. I think until it gets that credibility, it will always be marginalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I started out by saying that we have seen a quote unquote explosion of exhibitions, which is certainly um, true if you use that lens of uh, examining it from the Barbican to biennials devoted um, to the subjects, etc. But if you compare that to the breadth of exhibitions in the art world at large, of course, it's still a very small uh, slice. So showing more of that um, of it also would be important. And collecting it mm -hmm. and, and uh, creating the language for it to be understood and the trajectory for how it overlaps in history mm -hmm. and what it comes out of, uh, which is lacking. And most of those shows had pretty much the same work. And, and you know, they, they uh, came and they went, but they're not a way that one could permanently go back and study or, or experience what, what this really all means or the differences in what it means. Yeah, I think creating a language and also having a more historical approach and uh, building that kind of crossover, which Code of Arms also does, is absolutely crucial here. Yeah. 
economy. It's quite an interest in China, yeah. actually. There's a lot of institutions in China who are really putting a lot of energy, maybe kind of as part of the AI wars, to like show that they are really engaging with art and culture around AI. Um, so you have the Tank Museum, and there have been a bunch of museums, the AIII Art Center in Shanghai, great name, <laughs> um, which is showing my work at the moment. And also in Germany, I've noticed, they seem to be quite up on it. Um, but yeah, kind of in terms of having the dialogue around it, but like you said as well, like preservability, I think that is such an important thing, kind of how it's collected, how it's preserved in the future, like getting technical staff in to understand where the code is important, where it's not important, how this thing can be preserved for the future. Um, I mean, I'm working with Gazelli Art House here, and now we're kind of thinking through some of these sorts of things together. Um, and, you know, taking it to the VNA as well, who are doing quite a good job of, of thinking through some of those things. Um, but yeah, no, it is an interesting one. And I, I want more voices. I want to see more voices coming in. And I totally agree with Lynn. I think it's often the same voices. I think people, you know, maybe I'm looking at kind of queerness, but people looking at race, people looking at disability, look, people looking at class, like people coming from all sorts of different perspectives to look at maybe some of the problems within these systems. Um, actually using the processes themselves, but also sometimes not using the processes, just kind of commenting on them. Um, so yeah, I think we need more diversity for sure. I think that's a problem with the fine art world though, that it often becomes very narrow. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's also a very normal evolutionary cycle. You know, I uh, did an exhibition in the new school galleries on AI and I decided to focus it a lot more precisely because I had seen this slew of exhibitions around the world with a huge, huge overlap between works. But I think that is also an initial phase, you know, where museums and institutions kind of jump on the obvious and what's in the echo chamber and now luckily i think we see a little bit more of a broadening and also more focused exhibition so i fully agree with you i hope that will um, continue in the future and as to preservation it's one of the issues that basically concerns all of digital art not only ai based art institutions have made a lot of progress in the past 20 years um, or so, but there's still a lot of groundwork to be laid and more commitment to be made, as um, Lynn says. So before we, yeah, Paul, did you want to? Yeah, just a couple of things. I mean, I, I'm very much of two minds over this question of what's what's the proper way or what, what are some ways for museums to introduce people to AI and algorithmic art. I was at the um, Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum over the weekend in Boston. And it was uh, her, her request, her, her direction that there should be no labels on any of the work. So you, you walk through the museum completely blind. You don't know who you're looking at. If you don't know your art history, you don't know what you're looking at. Um, and in a way, it was a fascinating experience. I mean, I found myself thinking much harder about the work. Um, and then we went downstairs to a, a touring show. I think it's coming out of London. It was six Titians. Um, and there was a fairly elaborate description of each of these paintings and why they've been brought together, how they've been brought together. Um, it didn't stop me looking at the paintings, but what I realized is that since one of them was the Rape of Europa, um, the gallerists had to, the curators had to take up the issue of rape and talk about rape and how it was viewed by Philip II. Um, and in a way, I sort of didn't want that either because it's, you know, 500 years removed and who knows whether they're right about any of that stuff. So, so I found myself thinking, um, we have to be very, very careful about what curators actually say about the work. Um, but I'm also looking at Jake's work thinking if he hadn't told us what it was about, I would be baffled or more baffled, right? So, so, so anyway, let me just wrap up with two questions that Harold got asked all the time because he spent a lot of time in museums with people. Question number one, so, you tell it what to do, and it just does what you say, right? That was, that's always the first question. The second question was always, so it's random? Mm -hmm. So there are two huge misconceptions about algorithmic art that if you don't do anything else, you should at least address those. 
Yeah, yeah. And I have uh, received those questions for at least the past three decades, and I'm sure Lynn has, you know, gotten her f fair share of it. And this is, of course, precisely the core of this discussion too. Once again, this idea of autonomy and agency and uh, an understanding of how algorithms work and how they are set up. I think every all the artists who created uh, computer drawings in the 60s got these reactions. I've heard many um, of many stories about that. And I believe that process of demystification of contextualization is still very much needed. As a curator, I'm horrified by having no labels, et cetera. You know, let's keep in mind, you are a very, you come to this from a very sophisticated point of uh, view already, you know, and um, that's not true for anyone walking in. It's an interesting experiment to have no um, information, but at the same time, I believe uh, context is key and there's still a lot uh, to do in that regard. So perhaps we're at a good point of opening this up to questions. Uh, um, I don't know if you have anything to add before you, we bring in the audience. Well, thank, thank you. Perfect, for, thank you. Thank you for an excellent um, presentation. I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the relation, the, the act of the artist talking about the work. And I think Mr. Cohen, said about his father that he was concerned that people were more interested in the machine than him. And it, it seemed that part of the creativity is to do with the actual machine producing the art and people engaging and watching that. And then there's another sort of question also for Mr. Cohen. Did perhaps his father become sort of jealous of the machine? Did he... Um, develop very human feelings, so that hence he sort of shut the machine down. Could that be a possibility? Um, I don't. I don't really know. Um, you know, Harold loved painting, um, and um, even when Aaron was making images, Harold would often overpaint them. Uh, he really liked painting. I don't think he was ever really comfortable with just giving the whole thing up to the machine. Um, he was never a representational artist. So we were all a little surprised when the machine was making pictures of people and animals and things like that. I think it was sort of fairly natural for him to see, see whether he could pull it off. But once he pulled it off, I think he sort of lost interest. Um, and I think he returned to his interest in, you know, this, this question that sort of drove him throughout, which is what are the minimal conditions under which marks convey meaning? And, and so really that um, and the question of color, you know, in, in the last few years of his life, that was what, that's what mostly he worked on. Um, I I don't know that he was jealous of the machine. If anything, he was immensely proud of it. Um, maybe maybe you think they amount to the same thing. I don't know. Um, he said all the time that the machine was a better colorist than him, than he was. Um, and this is from a guy who made his reputation as a colorist. Um, so no, I mean, I don't think he was trying to clip its wings or anything like that. I think he was just rethinking what it was for, uh, what, what role it had in his life as an artist. Um, there are other issues, you know, people get older. I mean, he, he was unable to stand and paint. Um, you know, his re relationship with the machine he, he couldn't stand for hours in galleries. So, I mean, people change over time. I, I don't think there was anything um, more than that going on. Yeah. That's very interesting. Can I ask a, just a follow-up question, please? Um, mm -hmm. In terms of an artist, the artist has 
copyright or ownership over an image it produces. But if, if an artist is working for an organization and the machine produces art, who does the art belong to? Does it belong to the machine or the organization or the artist? Um, well, um, I'm the wrong person to ask that, but you know, I, I, we are going to be facing so many questions like that in the coming years. Some people who are more highly skilled than I need to need to take them on. I can take on at least a part of this because the <laughs> precisely that question also came uh, up in one of our last acquisition committee meetings at the Whitney, since we're bringing some of Aaron in. And the question was, hmm, if we own uh, software that produces images, who owns those images? And the way it traditionally is within museums is or institutions, we do not own the copyright to the work then. Yeah, we may have the um, software, but if let's say, Aaron, a version of Aaron belongs to the Whitney Museum and produces drawings, we do not have the copyright to the drawing. That being said, this is all fairly new territory for institute collecting institutions. So a lot of this still needs to be figured out, but that would be one take on your question. And who determines whether it's art? Well, you know, we, <laughs> We decided, I think, at the point where uh, we bring work into an art collection, we decided that it is yeah, art. Yeah, in, in this instance, but, <laughs> but if a machine creates something that somebody says is art, why? Absolutely, yeah. 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 What, are the, what are the parameters that make it be called art? For the moment, um, I can find references for you afterwards. But um, I, yeah, my work's actually been included in a couple of these books, kind of about IP around this form of art. And there is like, there's yeah, there's there's a lot to unpick there in terms of like where the data sets coming from, the ownership, all of these sorts of things. I mean, generally, I think people come into the conclusion that yeah, if you're an artist and you're calling it art, then it can be. But I think there is definitely a huge amount to talk about there, yeah, especially if things can be infinitely generated, then how do you kind of catalogue that and where the original data came from? Are you creating your own data? So are you using open source data sets or are you, as the case of some artists, you know, just taking a museum's collection of copyrighted images, but then you're generating something new with it. So then that becomes... Right. Well, yeah, these are, I mean, these are the massive questions, right? So obviously, and that's the whole thing for me as well, is that I want to make sure that I always um, credit the engineers that worked on the code that then I build on top of. So when I'm coding, I'm obviously always using code below the open source code because I can't write all of this AI code myself. So I kind of hack on top of it. So absolutely, yeah. Because if somebody writes something, they've got copyright. If somebody writes software, yeah. they've got you use that software to produce art. Yes. You've got copyright. So. Yes, and this has become a huge problem. So, so the big auction at Christie's, I don't know if you saw that, where the first AI-generated painting, which it wasn't, um, sold for half a million by um, an art collective in Paris called Obvious. But the thing is, they took that model from an American teenager who had trained it on a data set of paintings, and that painting data set was also copyrighted. And, and then, you know, that teenager had taken the code from Ian Goodfellow, who originally came up with the idea of a generator network. So, so there are so many levels there. And then Christie's allowed it to happen. And I think it's actually possibly still being disputed. You can't quote me on that, but I'm not completely sure exactly what happened at the end of the sale, but it is a really interesting one. Like, you know, there are so many levels there where the people that wrote the code, the people that made the model, the people that had the original data set, and then this art collective came along and sold it through Christie's. So I don't know whether they're in their right. They pissed a lot of people off, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you could end up with chaos, couldn't you? You could end yeah. up with a situation where if people wanted to, they could say, well, it belongs to me, and you know, legal people get involved. And then eventually you just, where do you go with it? Exactly. Yeah, it's a question we're all asking ourselves at the moment. Can I, can I s say something about, about that image and also about autonomy and about the role of AI in art making? I've been wanting to say this all, all the hour. Um, what, what I found horrifying about that was that um, the people who made that image 
we're much more concerned with the surface attributes of the image than with anything else. So here's what I'd like to say. Um, and I, I'd like to use a couple of analogies. Um, I think we're probably all comfortable viewing art as an interaction between the mind of the artist and the mind of the viewer. There are two minds at work. There is the possibility that when AI gets involved, there are three minds at work. There's the mind of the person who created the AI, there's the AI itself, and there's the mind of the viewer, the mind of the person viewing the art. And you know, the interaction between those minds is something, um, well, I mean, Gombrich cared about it a lot. Um, when there were just two minds, I think we're gonna see a new, a new literature on how, how the three minds interact. But, but here's a trend in AI that I think everybody needs to be aware of. This sort of throws that whole quite exciting idea of three minds interacting into doubt. Um, and I'm gonna illustrate it with machine translation as an example. When AI got going, people thought the only to do translation was to take French, map it into a meaning representation, and then map it back into English. Right? The understanding was the words convey meaning, and until you got at the meaning, you could do the translation. And then Google Translate said, nope, that's all wrong. You can actually translate French into English without understanding what the words mean. You can go from surface form to surface form. Just the words themselves, no meaning. What's happened over the last 10 to 15 years of AI is that we are almost entirely about mapping one surface form to another. Now, I, I take note of Jake's point about latent spaces, which are not technically surface forms, but basically, most AI is mapping one surface form to another. And I think that throws in doubt this idea that in future, art could be the interaction of three minds, the mind of the artist, the mind of the AI, and the mind of the viewer. And I think that the sale, the portrait of whoever it was, I can't remember the name, was so clearly about surface forms. That, 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 that was about generating something that looked like a piece of art. That's what that was. And that really worries me because I like the idea of a dance of three minds. I think that's a really interesting way of viewing algorithmic art. But as long as you follow this trend in AI towards mapping surface form to surface form, caring not yet about why those images were made, then that puts that whole idea of three minds in jeopardy. Just to very quickly add to this, I think the idea of the three minds, which I really like, is one that is also inherent to digital art in general, beyond to not every form, but beyond AI. Um, I always saw digital art as having this kind of um, relationship of a third mind, you know, be that generativity in various ways or interaction or, as Myron Kruger said, response as a medium. So I think this is also inherent to the digital medium. And I fully agree regarding the translation of surface forms, unless you do it in an interesting way. I think there are also interesting ways of manipulating that. But a lot of what we're seeing right now isn't. And I think that's yet another important part of the work that organizations, institutions, artists need to do, you know, bring to the forefront that this may not be the most fruitful engagement with the technologies. So we have a question from our Zoom attendees from Simon Perkins. He's very much enjoying the talk and is asking, what was the first example of deep fake art? 
if any of the panelists would be able to address that. It's a very tricky question because the answer always depends on how do you define deep fakes and how uh, far do you go back in context? Uh, um, I would love to hear from everyone. One could even mention Nancy Burton in that context as getting even patents on the morphing softwares not technically a deep fake as we understand it, but contextually speaking, certainly in that area. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that's, a, I mean, again, I would say like, if I was being strict, a deep fake is technically something where you can actually control a body using a conditional generative adversarial network. So actually not many artists have been using that. I think most of the early art was just using GANs um, generative adversarial networks. So a bunch of the early ones using that was um, Memo Actin was one of the first, um, Mario Klingerman, um, Anna Riddler, um, you know, I think Gene Kogan is another one. Um, so yeah, there are some people kind of, you know, I mean, it was so recent, that was like six years ago. I mean, it's no time at all. Um, but now obviously, yeah, with deep fakes, it's this idea beyond that, that we can start to control faces. And actually, to be honest, I haven't seen too many artists doing it. I mean, that's what I'm using for my drag. Um, there are a few other artists that are playing with that, but I see it more on Instagram um, and see, you know, people making kind of deep fake Tom Cruise or Barack Obama's or Donald Trump's or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to see how people can actually impress me maybe using deep fakes um, for media art, but I haven't seen a huge amount of it yet. I might be completely wrong though. There's probably quite a lot out there and I probably think after this talk, oh shoot, I forgot all of those artists. <laughs> Something that Simon also added on was further to a question. My uncle and his advertising company, Streetlight Partnership, made a TV advert in 1997 for the Ford Puma car, perhaps is one of the first inspirations for deepfake art. They cut Steve McQueen's head from the original bu uh, Bullet 1968 film footage and placed it on the present day's actor's body realistically, showing the deceased McQueen driving the modern car around San Francisco. They won several awards for the hour and it can be found here and he sent a link so maybe we can share oh, that it with the panel like so maybe we, we, we can check this out later well, that's on. that yeah. example in a way of face swap but it's not using a neural network it's kind of has the same effect yeah. as a face swap algorithm which again is kind of you could call that a deep fake um and a type of deep fake but yeah so that sounds like a sort of manual way of making a face swap <laughs> We have also another question from Ernest Edmonds, and he's asking, back in 1970, Strout, Kornack, and I proposed a question in the paper we presented. Will the artist be amplified or superseded by the computer? Where do the panel think we are today in respect of this question? I think we, just uh, jumping in quickly, I think that was already part of our discussion in terms of the autonomy and uh, agency and where, uh, at what point can you say that there is originality in what a machine creates? And um, certainly there has been a lot of technological progress, but at the core, I think the question still is, the same one that Harold Cohen addressed in his work or um, that basically all of the panelists are addressing in their work. And it seems to be an obsession in general. Everybody I talk to is like obsessed with, you know, um, algorithms exceeding human capacity. Once again, we're still creating those algorithms for a specific purpose. And I'm not saying that there can be a massive jump, but I'm also not sure why it's interesting. <laughs> I'd agree with that as well. I think well, the dichotomy a lot around it over the years as well. Like when I first got into this five years ago, I was really interested in that, the sort of philosophy of consciousness. How can we bring that into these systems? But I think I realized that often it's actually professors in ivory towers and it's not a very accessible or interesting subject to quite a lot of people. <laughs> and that actually maybe the more pressing issues are the social issues or, or just finding poetry and beauty and kind of exploring the aesthetics of these things as well. I think we had also a question from Alex Estrick to Paul Cohen. It's a rare 
privilege to hear you speak about Harold's work. Thank you. I was wondering if you might say something about how Harold viewed his Aaron work in relation to other lineages of computer and AI arts, such as Nies, Nake, Noel, Moore, Molnar, for example. It is sometimes difficult to know how to narrate Harold Cohen in relation to others, which of course only reflects on how powerful his contribution is. So if Paul could say a few words. So, so I don't really know the answer to that question and I was sort of dreading it. Um, he and Frida Naka were very close friends. Um, I'm sure they, they influenced each other. Um, I don't wanna say anything mean about my dad, but he was pretty self-centered and he did his own work. Um, I don't think that he was very influenced by other people's work. I, I've, you know, he left London in the 60s, um, went to San Diego and put his head down. And I don't think he paid too much attention to other people, fr frankly. He had good friends like Frida Naka. And, he, you know, I, I know they discussed things, but, but I, th I think he was very much his own, his own man. Out historically speaking, Harold Cohen is often mentioned as belonging to the algorithms in terms of the algorithmic exploration of art making. But um, I would say Harold's work is also in a category um, of its own because it is um, very different from what uh, Manfred Moore, Frida Naka, Edward uh, Edmonds and um, all of the algorithmically engaged artists have created because their concern was uh, ultimately really not uh, an artificial drawing machine and collaboration between human and machine and the AI based uh, approach that is not at the core of Manfred Moore's exploration of hypercubes and fourth dimensions um, or of Vera Molnar's uh, work. So intersection, yes, but I would really say Harold is in a category of it. I, I'd add to that that um, Harold, um, it was not Harold's project to challenge the viewer with the fact that the work was algorithmic. Now, as it happened in, in galleries, you know, people were kind of taken aback by it, but, but Harold did not say the following. He did not say, look, I'm gonna make you think about whether algorithms can make art. That was, that was never the project. And so the work never really looked algorithmic. In fact, the very first work he did, the very most basic thing he did, um, and this is in the late 60s, very early 70s, was to uh, come up with an algorithm that made a line that looked like it was a freehand line. And he never, ever wanted the work to look algorithmic. Thank you both, that's fantastic. We have another question from Jamila Knowles, um, who's asking, I did my degree in AI and I'm doing my MA in illustration. I make images about AI as it is really. It is in opposition to the shiny white robots and flying maths we see in the media and marketing. I wondered what the panel thinks of the ways that AI is described visually in the news. So maybe, I don't know, maybe Lynn can address this question? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't pay attention to the way it's described or the way it is presumed to look because it, it's uh, it's so superficial. I think it's uh, in general just just a, a, a tool to try to get people drawn into the conversation, but it certainly doesn't uh, have either uh, for me any, any accuracy or any even metaphor. It's one of my pet peeves. I actually uh, eliminated the slide from my short intro. I shouldn't have. It precisely shows the shiny white robot, you know, and makes clear that it 
robot AI artists in order to walk and do what they're doing. They need that onboarding um, of AI. But um, yeah, all we can do, I think, is fight that misconception of what AI is and arrive at a different visual language for representing it in advertising, et cetera. Personally, I always find it annoying. You know? Yeah, it's too limiting. And it's generally human looking. Is generally human and good looking woman looking. It hasn't changed since Metropolis. It's awful. The robot has to be female and has to be good looking. Draw nuts. So preferably. And we actually have a quite a good question that leads on from there from Ben Chang. Regarding the mystifying the technology, the behavior of many deep learning systems is mystifying even to the people who make them. What does that mean for how artists can demystify them? Interesting question. Um, I think there are different kinds of mystification. I think yeah, I, I, I kind of feel often that the engineers actually intentionally mystify these processes by making like really dense, convoluted academic papers. Um, because I think sometimes there's a fear that that will add to the fear mongering if the public kind of get too engaged or involved with the research that's coming out, which, you know, I think is a big mistake. I think these things need to be communicated. I think we need to get a bigger diversity of voices. Um, absolutely. I think there's, you know, there's a black box. It is a black box. We're talking about this neural network where you can't always fully understand and how it's coming to the conclusion it's coming to. There's a big field in AI of explainability, of trying to like open up this black box, trying to create machine learning algorithms with sometimes uncertainty, or machine learning algorithms can kind of explain their thinking process to you. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's, it's a weird of, and then also there's the whole mystification which, you know, corporations do, like through marketing, which is like, hey, it's this big, I don't know, shiny thing that we can all use. So. I don't know, I try to navigate it the best that I can as an artist, like trying to teach myself from an artist's point of view, I don't come from a computer science point of view, like trying to understand this thing and then honestly represent it as well as I can. Um, but we're all limited. I think art allows you to demystify things in new ways. So that's what's quite exciting. Um, thank you so much. It was such an interesting conversation. I, I have a, a little follow-up questions to Paul, actually. I was wondering what is happening to Aaron after Harren Coyne passed away. Speaking about agency and how much machine depends on the artist, I think it would be really interesting to know when did the machine die as well after the artist was gone? Thank you so much. Well, it didn't die, but it's been resting. Uh, so um, it's, it's a question we've been wrestling with um, some people want to turn it on and generate uh, additional work. Um, some people view that as new work. Some people are inspired by Harold's quip about being the first artist to have a posthumous exhibition of new work. I think actually it's a really tricky question. Um, and it's one that um, Christiane is also thinking about a lot um, because the Whitney um, it has, is it okay to say that Whitney is, is um, buying some of Harold's code? Um, and, and so all of those questions are very present right now. Harold, for what it's worth, um, uh, did not want other people messing around with his code. He didn't mind executables being out there for people to enjoy, but he didn't want anyone messing around with the code. That was his code. Thank you. Sorry for to, to follow up questions. They're very, they're related questions. And the first one is to Mr. Cohen. In, in terms of you talked about three minds, and to my mind, the mind of the machine represents the ideal for human beings. It was altruistic, selfless, giving. It doesn't ask for anything it produces. Completely, you know, think, doing nothing for itself, but just producing something. But, and the related question is, I'll give it to Jake really, should an artist be an outsider, or i.e. to be an artist, or how do they retain that 
integrity or that independent voice or I, if they're part of the inside, the most, you can never distance yourself from your own personal needs of, unlike the machine. So that's a sort of, the sort of questions really, the two, the two of them. <laughs> Thank you. Shall I go quickly first and then hand it back to Paul? Um, yeah, I think, I think it is, there's definitely an important place for the outsider. I think that's something I have to think about quite a lot when it comes to like sponsorship, for instance. So like, you know, working with Google, I have to question really hard, like, in a way, I, I'm kind of working against them. And actually, if I do a residency with Google, does that change the relationship? And I think it does somewhat, you know, obviously I'd never want to kind of sell the data of the marginalized community, the drag community that I'm working with to one of these companies in a position of power. Um, but I don't know, I think you can work within these systems as well. I don't think you have to be a complete outsider. I think there's an absolute place for like kind of interdisciplinary practice and sort of the cross-pollination of like working with the code and working as an artist. And I think, you know, there's something really brilliant about that, bringing together different disciplines. So in that sense, maybe not an outsider. But I would say that what I said before about the sort of critical step that you're allowed to take back as an artist, I think that's vital, that I'm not designing this for anyone else. I can kind of take that step back and comment on something or critique it or find poetry but, but, in it. But can you? I mean, can you re realistically, in, in the society we live in, can you do that? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe there's something we need to carry on discussing afterwards. But I'm here, and these guys are not going to be in the room afterwards. So I'll hand over to Paul. <laughs> well, very briefly, because I know we need to wrap up. Um, Humans are marvelous minds. They're incredible minds. I'm disappointed with AI minds, and I'm particularly disappointed with the direction AI is going in, because I think it's actually moving away from being able to build minds that can augment our own and, and minds that we can enjoy, enjoy conversing with. I, I think AI has lost an awful lot of its original um, mission. Uh, I am still hopeful. I, I really like the idea uh, that one day um, um, AIs will be the kind of um, uh, gentle, helpful, um, dis, uh, encouraging, um, inspiring minds that you were alluding to a moment ago. But I do think you have to keep, I do think you have to be very careful that because AI has become See, see, what happened is in the first half of AI, we tackled problems that we thought were really hard. Now we tackle problems we know we can solve with available technology. That's basically AI in a nutshell. And because so many of those problems involve various kinds of classification, right? because classification is such a fundamentally um, fundamental thing that, that if you can classify, you can do almost anything. You can... You, you can do credit scoring, you can sell products. You, AI has sort of jumped down that rabbit hole and we've lost sight of almost everything that inspired us in the first place. So I really look forward to getting back to some of these more inspiring things that you were talking about. It can be done. Um, and I, I, don't, I, I don't think there's a real choice about being an outsider if you're an artist. I think that you just are. I think it gives you a different perspective on what's going on. So it's not like uh, somebody says, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll work as an outsider today and, and tomorrow I'll, I'll be a, a different uh, sort of being. I, th I think it's just as part of the process of, of having that distance um, uh, and being able to see things in, in a different way. Thank you so much. I think this is a great note to end on. I also apologize. I actually need to leave to teach classes. You know, and of course, you could continue the conversation, but I need to log off. <laughs> so thanks could so much to everyone. Thank you to Christian. Everybody. Sure. Thanks so much. Okay. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>